مساء الخير It's it's nice to it's marhaba it's nice to see you all here um, and thank you for coming to the session on, on re, um, launching um, Jean Francois's um, excellent report on the merger of um, of Aramco and Sabic. Um, the, the session is entitled Mega Merchants, the Politics of Creating Synergies. Now, um, we would like the session to be as interactive as possible. So what we'll do first is I'll give a small intro, then I'll ask everybody just one or two questions. We'll have a little discussion and we'll very quickly open it up for the question to the floor for questions. Um, uh, as for the intro. Um, GCC has seen mega mergers of state-owned entities like Aramco Sabic or Mudabala um, IPIC, um, which is later combined with Abu Dhabi Investment Council and is now a powerhouse exceeding 300, uh, $230 billion in assets. There's been a wave of mergers in the banking sector, um, driving long-needed consolidation, which Jean-Francois could also tell us, tell us something about, because he used to be a banker in the region, and creating synergies. Many of these enjoyed government backing, like the Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank merger with, with Union National Bank, which then um, bought um, Al-Hilal Al Bank. Now, but this session is really about Jean-Francois um, Zeznik's report, um, um, which is called the Saudi Aramco Sabic merger, how acquiring Sabic fits into long-term di diversification strategy. Therefore, we will dedicate the majority of the session to um, Aramco's acquisition of 70% of Sabic shares in March 2019. We may draw parallels where, where appropriate and we'll draw, um, open it up just a little bit more afterwards. So, I'm starting with you, and I'm introducing my panelists as I'm asking them the first question, so you know exactly who you're talking to. Um, this is um, Jean-Francois Zeznik. Um, he's a PhD, he has been a professor, he's been a banker, he's been a banker in Riyadh um, in the 70s, um, and he's a senior fellow of the Global Energy Center of the Atlantic Council. He lives in the US. Um, uh, Dr. Sesnik, you wrote the report, and I would I would actually encourage you all to 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 read the report. It's really an um, exceedingly well written and well researched report. Um, we've seen a big push towards downstream integration in most GCC countries, be it UAE, be it Saudi, um, Kuwait, everywhere. Um, could you please elaborate on how you feel the merger fits into Aramco's long-term diversification strategy? Could that strategy have been achieved by organic means, you know, um, by uh, doing it yourself? Or did, 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 did the inorganic solution give them the most bang for the buck? Well, thank you very much, uh, Cornelia. This is a very, very nice introduction, really. Um, the, the, this uh, merger has been very, very interesting uh, to me, and it, because it sort of came at the uh, the juncture of two um, two efforts in the kingdom, one of them by uh, PIF to raise money and uh, to raise cash, and the other one by Saudi Ramco to go downstream as much as possible. And uh, why did uh, Saudi Ramco want to go downstream? Is uh, mainly because at the time uh, the minister Khaled Al Fali, who is a brilliant man, wanted to uh, uh, make sure that um, Saudi Ramco would be seen by the world market as a, um, how should I say, as an inter almost like an international oil company. And all the international oil companies today go; they want to not be oil companies anymore. They want to be. Uh, energy companies and chemical companies, and this is, so invest greatly into natural gas and in uh, chemicals. So uh, that was the strategy of of uh, Mr. Khaled Al Fali, and it so happened that since PIF needed money, uh, they were willing to sell uh, Sabic, which is their main and best investment. I mean, so the so PIF have been, has been getting 20% return on its money ever since Sabic was created, so that's that's done very well. So the, um, 
at this at this juncture, Saudi Ramco was happy to get Sabic, and it, it, it did fit in their uh, willingness and the effort to go downstream. Now, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Ramco wanted to, or still has, officially the notion that they will go 10 million barrels a day in refining. They're at about five and a half today. But they also started two very large uh, chemical companies, Sadara and Petrorabeg, which are huge. And uh, Sabic will really kick them forward much faster. That, in that sense, it's been that really worked very well. So um, the, um, whether or not it's, uh, this development could have been achieved organically, yes. Definitely, because that's what they have done with Sadara and with uh, Petro Rabig. On the other hand, Saudi Ramco knows very well that they, they know nothing about chemicals, really. So they uh, they wanted to. They did very big uh, joint ventures, one with Dow, Chem Dow, Dow Chemicals, and the other one with Sumitomo. And they've learned a lot from these, but they still are managed by Sumitomo and um, by by Dow. Now. With Sabic, then all of a sudden you get a, a, a company which is extremely of good, uh, and Sabic is today the fourth largest chemical company in the world, and uh, they have their own research centers, they have their own sales team, and uh, it's very advanced uh, in some some sorts of chemicals. So they, uh, the Saudi Ramco will greatly benefit from that. Um, so they could have grown organically and continue to do that, but it would have taken a lot more time. So uh, now they can do it through the acquisition, and I think that worked very well. Or, one thing I want to, uh, to, to, to precise is that the, the acquisition hasn't taken place. There's been an agreement to have an acquisition, but the, uh, that it will not be closed until the, sometime during the middle of the year. Yeah, that's a very important point, and I just have a, a very quick follow-up questions before I go, which you can ask uh, answer very quickly. You know, when you look at Sabic, Sabic actually bought um, a company that I know very well because I spent more than ten years in GE. Um, <laughs> that they bought um, they um, they bought GE Plastics. Um, how important has just been that in terms of you know just know-how in terms of knowledge because that really turned that was a game changer. It turned Sabic into a re truly international, especially also in terms of technology c company. How important was that? Oh, uh, absolutely vital. Uh, the, the GE Plastics acquisition changed Sabic totally. It made it into a, a world famous company. Before that, there, people heard about Sabic, but they were mostly doing general chemicals. But once they acquired GE, and all the research centers of GE and all the sales teams of GE, they really uh, were known worldwide. And that has made the biggest difference. And that's what Aramco would be acquiring. And that's where there's a lot of value. That, that, that is excellent. So, um, y you know, w w when you look at big mergers, and again, I've been in m and I've run m and for two large entities. Um, one was G Energy and the other one was um, in BP. When you look at it in the wake of these things, in the, in, in, in the tailwind of these things, you always, you try to create synergies. How, how can synergies being created? How free is, um, is, is um, the new entity once, it's, once the, um, the, 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 the merger is consummated to create the, to, to create the, um, the, the synergies? Um, and um, what will they sell? Because you always sell non-core assets. And who will they sell to? Well, this is a very political the, the situation. I'm sure our Saudi friends here will know that better than anybody. But uh, I mean, definitely, if, if this was a standard normal merger, you will see one, uh, Sabic or Saudi Ramco would uh, divest immediately the uh, steel company because it's losing money and it has nothing to do with the business of Saudi Ramco. On top of it, it's eating an enormous amount of natural gas. The, uh, the second thing they could do, would likely to do, is merge or sell their, um, their, their uh, agricultural division, their agribusiness, to Maaden, and Maad, because uh, Maaden is already very, very successful in making DPA, and this is done with Sabic already, who provides the ammonia. So Maaden could do that, and 
um, um, do the marketing of this stuff. So that those are the kind of uh, of changes that that may take place or may not take place because it will really change the uh, the, the the way things are in in the kingdom. Yeah, Maiden is a very very interesting player. From nowhere, became number ten mining company in yeah. the world. That's a very very interesting success story. Um, Ellen, you wrote the. It's not just a book, she wrote the book on the history of um, Saudi Aramco and I would like to, um, to recommend to everybody to go on Amazon or to go into the next bookstore and buy the book and read it cover to cover. You won't put it down. It's, it's just, it's a brilliant piece of work. Um, so the, what do you think about the rationale of the merger? You know, from a historic perspective, you're an economic historian. What do you think about the rationale of the merger? Were you surprised to be see the timing of the acquisition because it was quite close to you know when when one started to think about and actually then do the IPO? So uh, thank you very much um, <laughs> for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so I I think I I maybe could push back on some of the the rationales here and introduce maybe some some complicating uh, factors. So one one of the interesting things uh, to also consider is that. Um, Aramco has a, a much longer history of working for towards diversification. Um, you know, this was a strategy that that Ali Al Naimi talked about and and began basically as soon as Aramco's contracts with its former parent companies ended. As soon as they no longer had to sell all of their uh, crude oil to the former parent companies, uh, Exxon, Chevron, uh, Texaco, and um, mobile, that's really when this diversification strategy began and in very small ways, you know, with the joint venture um, that became Motiva and then later into, um, into Asian uh, countries, uh, South Korea was first and then uh, Japan and also China uh, and uh, Malaysia and the, uh, well, not Malaysia, the Philippines uh, as well. So I think there's, there's definitely a longer history of the push towards uh, diversification into downstream, but uh, the timing definitely is, uh, is, is of interest. And one of the, the issues that Jean-Francois raised in the report had to do with the fact that SABIC was benefiting greatly from uh, very, very low cost uh, natural gas that it was receiving from Aramco. And when they started to discuss the Aramco IPO, that would have been a very big issue uh, on uh, you know on the books for um, you know for uh, investors to to consider, and so that issue had to be resolved in some way. And one of the ways to resolve that is you know to have Aramco buy Savic because then uh, you know then then they're not essentially giving away natural gas to to a company. So that's it's an interesting you know uh, rationale I think that that was important here. Um, and but also Aramco's push to really be this this IOC. And it's interesting to consider uh, the um, the ratio between uh, upstream to downstream. And most IOCs today are very are much heavily into downstream. Uh, for Aramco to to get that kind of ratio, they'd probably have to acquire about ten percent of the world's downstream. Uh, and so I think, uh, or they'd have to divest themselves of their upstream assets, which uh, is not going to happen and would also probably threaten the, the profitability of, of the company. So um, they need to do more downstream, but I don't think we're ever going to see the kind of ratio that, say, a Chevron or an Exxon uh, has. It's just not really a, a viable uh, potential. So uh, the last thing that, that I would add is, is the timing issue is that um, when Aramco makes acquisitions, they want to do it at the best possible time. And uh, this is a very expensive uh, purchase for them. And um, it certainly seems like it, it had to happen at a certain time and perhaps not the best timing for uh, Aramco. They might have uh, you know, wished wish to, to purchase it for, for less, uh, maybe at a different time uh, in kind of the, the cycle. Uh, at least that's, that's some of the, the issues that I think were raised. Um, and... You know, there's also the issue of what about Savic's uh, other shareholders? Because it's only 70% owned by the PIF. There's, it's floated on, on Tadabal. And those uh, shareholders were not offered a chance to sell their shares to Aramco at the time of the deal, 
which I think uh, they really suffered because the price dropped, the, the share price dropped after the sale was announced. And yet, it, it hasn't happened yet, of course, but it, it dropped. And so uh, Aramco pay or will pay a lot more for those shares uh, than perhaps they were worth. That's that's actually ve that's a very interesting. It's a ve very very pertinent points, and then I know you've you've been looking very much into ownership structures, both of the of the parent company of of, of Aramco of Sabic. Um, the and as you mentioned, Jean Francois, the, the the money is going to the PIF. PIF has actually sold its 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 highest yielding asset. I mean, it, it has other assets, but its highest yielding asset um, and sh should go into Vision 2030. We'll see where it's go. Can you sort of comment where you, where you think what you think about what's hap going to happen with the proceeds of the of the of the um, the sale? Yeah, the sale. So, so it's interesting because. Um, yes, SABIC was a very profitable enterprise for the PIF, but then again, um, if they had to start buying natural gas at market prices from Aramco, that might have changed. So, um, you know, so we have to remember, remember that issue. Also, PIF had a, a goal to be less into, um, to be less into oil and gas. And so then it would make sense to, to sell SABIC because they, they want to invest in, in other uh, areas. The question of, of the money, I mean, they made more money or they will make more money off of this sale than they would will potentially make off of the uh, Aramco IPO. Mm -hmm. So to, to kind of keep it in perspective. Uh, but then when, when you look at the, um, they're going to make more money off of, off of it. And, uh, you know, there was clearly a desire for the PIF for cash. Um, but, uh, you know, where, what are they going to do with that money? Where is it going to be invested? Those are, are questions. And whether they can invest in areas that will earn them as much or more than they were making off of SABIC is, is another question. Um, and I think you also discussed some of the, the issues with the IPO and, and where that money is going. And we really don't even know where that money has has gone, is it going to the PIF or is it going to to the state, uh, and how that's how that's working out? So um, you know, there's still a lot of a lot of questions there. Yeah, and what what we have to say though is yes, that the, the, they made less money out of the IPO, but they only sold um, a very very small portion of the of the company versus with Savic, it's it's seventy percent of the yes. company. So relatively, if you look at the valuation, if you take it from that small portion, we would we would hit the two trillion at this point of time. So um, so we will so 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 we need to put that into perspective. But I'm going to the to the to the next panel. Panelist, Dr. Sara uh, um, Vakhshuri. Um, she's the founder and president of SBV Energy International. She's also U.S.-based. I and I learned that um, that the two that the two um, speakers, the two of you who are Washington-based, are our neighbors. That's quite good. So your neighbors there. You're, so I put Ellen between you now, so you're not neighbors here as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you, your company does, you know, inve it does give advice to, to, to various companies and also to investment banks. And that's why I'm sort of going to, to ask you some, some, some sort of questions in that, that thing. I will ask you, also ask you a second question, which goes broader, because you've looked just at a very broad spectrum of, of the industry. So I thought you were the, you were the person to answer that one. Um, but, 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 but um, uh, could you elaborate um, um, the, um, on the highly, highly successful um, initial bond offering with, with a very, very professional prospectus? For all of those of you who have not read the prospectus of the bond offering, you should read it. It reads very well. Um, if you're into that sort of thing, um, but um, can you sort of elaborate in the in the in in the in the in on that bond offering in the light of the merger because the merger was announced in March, and the bond offering then came in the summer and the, the prospectus was out just slightly afterwards. Could you sort of talk a little bit about that and about what you feel about that timing? Um, 
Thank you for having me and for the kind introduction. When I think uh, something that I would like to put it based on what Jean-Francois and Ellen said, uh, when we were working with the investment banks and generally any investors that they were looking into acquiring or purchasing Aramco's share, they were looking at it in a, as a strategic investment. So the decision for merging Aramco with Sabic had a very strategic uh, decision, not, I mean, obviously we talked about the profits and all those uh, uh, important uh, points that uh, has been mentioned already. But if you look at it, we are now, where where is the condition of market today? We are at the time that we are hearing about peak of uh, oil demand, especially the black oil. And if you look at it in the next decade, where is the oil mostly used? petrochemical, and among the petrochemical would be fertilizers and plastic. So to acquire for Aramco, that is a major producer of crude oil, and as was described already, historically had a very significant investment into downstream, into refineries, both domestically and globally, to create a secure market share. Now Saudi Aramco is moving step forward to create that security of market share for decades to come that we are talking about the peak of demand with investing in petrochemical. And there are estimates that by, um, by the targets that Saudi Aramco would have now, Sabic, if Sabic, I mean the acquisition happened, within the next five years, Saudi Aramco is going to be self-sufficient in the market demand and it's going to acquire a security of demand uh, for a major oil uh, producer. And there are other profits. So when the investors were looking, they're looking at the low oil prices that if you are just an upstream con company and have a lot of um, uh, investments in the downstream, is not necessary exciting moment uh, for a company. But when you're looking into that downstream perspective, suddenly the whole game changes. And by uh, acquiring, because uh, already Jean-Francois described, Saudi Aramco already had uh, a chemical uh, companies, but there are differences. So um, uh, Sadara and uh, Petra uh, uh, Baggy, uh, Rabi. Yes, Rabi. And they, they are the chemicals that they are liquid based. So they are producing petrochemical based on liquids, but Sabic is specifically uh, produces petrochemical from gas. So merging these two together, it creates that synergy and efficiency. Also, the, the discussions that Ellen said about the gas that you are going to offer, the, uh, the, the gas that is flared in a discounted rate. So it's a very strategic um, uh, move that they did, and that's why that created a huge demand the other thing that was important uh, in the success of the IBO was the transparency. Uh, for decades to come, uh, everybody was seeing the major producers, especially in the Middle East and Gulf region, as not being transparent. Everybody was questioning their resource, resources, their reserves, their production. But Saudi Aramco took a very big step into transparency. And that was also another major uh, component for the success. Uh, of the initial, uh, the IBO that you were discussing. Yeah, no, and uh, it it was really, it's it's really, and it was, as uh, Jean-Francois, maybe you quickly want to talk about it. The process of, of, of getting there was, was quite long. So I'll give you, as you wrote the report, you get one answer more than the rest <laughs> of them. So maybe you want to quickly talk about that. Um, you mean the process of... Yeah, of, of, the, of, the, of the Yes, well, it was a long time coming because in order to achieve this transparency, and this transparency has been very important for Saudi Aramco. They've been trying to achieve that for a long time, and uh, uh, Khaled al Faria was really pushing for that. Um, they, they had to issue audited statements, and of course the company did not have audited statements. In fact, technically speaking, it was not even a company. 
the company was actually created two years ago, and the shares were issued to the Ministry of uh, Energy. And uh, so they had to establish themselves as a corporation, which they were not. They had to get a, an audit firm, a good one, on, uh, Arthur Young in this case, to do all the accounting of the company and publish it and sign off on it. And then they had much more difficult, they had to do an audit of the oil in the ground. And, and even though Aramco does not own the oil, it's, it's basically bought from or leased by, uh, by Saudi Aramco from the state, they still had to know, since it's their main asset, where is the oil, how much there is. And that, that was done by a, a, an auditing company from Houston who specializes in that kind of thing. So it was really a long time. It took a couple of years for them to be able to do that. And then once they did that, then things moved, and that's, when that's why this uh, prospectus you mentioned is so good. Yeah, and when you look at that, when you look at that, these things always take time. Whenever you go public with somebody, these these things always take time. Ellen, you would like to say something? Yeah, I, I'd like to, to add one one aspect. It's not just the amount of time that it takes to produce the documents and do the audit, but there was a, a very big issue that um, came to light with the the with the the prospectus for the the bond offering, which was the fact that um, Aramco was was basically providing. Um, energy to the Saudi government for no compensation. And that was something that not only needed to be resolved, and there was a very elaborate scheme that was created in order for the government to, um, you know, try to, try to equ they call it equalization, to, to equalize that. And that regime, that new fiscal regime, had to not just be created, but had to be in place for some time. They had to show that on the, on the books in order for it to be, uh, you know, acceptable to, to investors. And so, um, you know, when people wonder, well, why did the, the IPO take so long from the time they started talking about it, it's not just the process of doing it, but they needed to, that fiscal regime was, was very, very key because no investor would, would look at that and say, oh, you know, we're, we're, we think that's a, a good idea seeing how much free energy they were giving. Yeah, and, and I think that's something we will see throughout the region. We will see subsidies go down. We will see more, uh, more, more, more transparency and people starting to have to pay for things. That's going to be that's going to be an interesting. I'm coming back to Sarah, if I may. Um, you know, you've you've looked at the region very broadly, um, and which is why I'm coming to you. When you look at these and, and the, the way the Atlantic Council framed this topic was that we needed to talk about regional mega mergers, um, the politics of, of creating synergies. When you look at the region, obviously we had um, we had um, the Aram Kosabic merger, we had um, Mubadala I IPIC, and that's more of a holding company. That's more of a financial type transaction you had the banks um, where do you see do you see other big merchants coming out or do you see more smaller things or or companies acquiring foreign companies for know-how such as Sabic dig with with with, with GE plastics where, where do you see it going let's go beyond KSA let's look at you know let's look at Kuwait the UAE and and, and, and the rest of it sure um, before Going to the rest of the region, uh, I just wanted to add one point uh, to the previous uh, question of a strategy and something that is um, very important. Another important issue is the technology of crude oil to chemical, which now Saudi Arabia is investing a lot on that and acquiring SABIC is going to help by merging the two research centers and mm -hmm. working a lot on that to bypass the refinery sector and produce the chemicals and the final products that are in more demand. So building upon this, I would... Can I ask a question on that? Sure. Um, there has been some rumors, there has been some rumors in the press that the big project, the $20 billion project of uh, crude to chemical had been canceled. So would that... I mean, so uh, that, that sort of, I was wondering, I mean, have you heard anything about that? Um, no, would you like to... I don't know. I mean, that's why I'd like to... <laughs> Maybe we can ask her. I'd like to can confirm we, can that. Can we but just first yes. finish and then we go to the yes, questions, yes. if you don't mind? <laughs> yes. If you don't Jean mind. Francois. I don't have a detail on that, Jean-Francois. But what I know is that on the technological side, yeah, they have put a lot of 
investment yeah, on that side. So moving, I would not call it a pol politics of a mergers. I would say the strategic uh, mm -hmm. of the mergers. And if you look at it, let's looking at Abu Dhabi and UAE, because now we're sitting in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, we did a lot of a study on the Abu Dhabi energy transition uh, program. Mm -hmm. So all these mergers that we see are kind of a result of a market realities and the strategy of these countries for reshaping their energy industry and the whole economic system by maximizing the, um, the assets that they have and produce a more efficient system that prepares the country for future. And okay. if you look at, for instance, Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi energy transition, the, it's, it's a very fundamental uh, change. They would start by uh, by energy demand management and going all through using their assets, using their companies to maximize their uh, assets, especially for these con com countries that are a major producer of oil, again, that we are uh, at the time that the dominant narrative of the market is that at some point this crude oil is not going to value as much as it does today. So if you want to prefer for tomorrow or decades to come, what you would you do is to have a strategy that not only you're going to, uh, uh, to control your uh, demand, but also to maximize uh, the benefit you can uh, from uh, the assets and the resources that you have through these mergers. So these mergers are not only creating the synergy and efficiency, but is also preparing the countries for dec decades to come. And in fact, there are not so many countries in the region that are uh, felt that wake-up call. Uh, we could like talk about Saudi Arabia and UAE, but there are many other countries in the region that they're still... I don't know, sleeping or maybe and not really preparing. What, what, um, and what role do you think, just to follow up on this, what role do you think we'll have also in order to prepare for that, to buy entities abroad, just to get the know-how on board? And that's less a merger than that is more than just strategic acquisitions. So um, again, I, I exactly, you framed it in a very good um, uh, strategic acquisition. So uh, for countries like Saudi Arabia or UAE that they are exporters, acquiring the assets outside of the country, it's, well, obviously brings a political leverage, but it's, it's about the security of demand. And when we are talking about energy security, historically everybody is talking about security of supply. But if you are a major producer, that your country's economy significantly depends on your export, security of supply is very important. And Saudi Arabia is a perfect example. As Ellen said, historically, they put a lot of effort in acquiring shares in the where their final markets are. Asia. And now what they're doing is that where is going to be the most demand for oil in petrochemical where in Asia. And all those um, projects that they're looking is to expanding the petrochemical uh, market and assets where it is. Something that is also very interesting is that Saudi Aramco is moving beyond crude oil and they're looking into natural gas. Uh, they're looking into trading LNG just as a trader, but also Saudi, Ra Saudi Arabia doesn't at this point have huge uh, natural gas reserves or production uh, to come. All this gas that we're talking using petrochemical are the gas that was flirted at some point. So what Saudi Arabia as a very smart strategy is looking is to establish petrochemical plants where the gas is yes. located, like United States, like Australia, like Qatar. Um, well, I would say United uh, States to come to begin. Qatar, Qatar I know everybody's no. like, no, yeah, <laughs> maybe not. But Australia and United States especially is that where the final market could be, especially in the U.S., because it's mm -hmm. very far from where Saudi Arabia is. Not only you could have a location for your market, but also you could use the gas prices at the uh, uh, source your pitch Helen would like to make yeah, a short uh, comment, and then I'm going to open to up. Just to comment on the, on the gas strategy, I would say it's, it's uh, you phrase it as a very smart strategy. It's also a necessary strategy because um, Saudi Arabia's uh, electricity requirements uh, and demand is going up and is projected to increase a lot to the extent that the amount of, and, and they have 
greatly shifted their electricity generation away from direct crude burn to natural gas, which is an excellent strategy for a lot of reasons, um, both uh, as a, as a, in terms of creating profit. You can make a lot more if you sell barrels of oil than if you're burning it in your uh, electricity plant and giving it at a very cheap price. Uh, and also, it's much better for, for the environment. But the question is, are, are they even producing enough associated gas to satisfy growing electricity demands? And so the natural gas strategy is not just one uh, you know, for, for profit, but is also a necessity for to meet the kingdom's uh, electricity needs going forward. Um, you know, to develop natural gas fields and also to potentially, at some point, import natural gas uh, into the kingdom. I think that's a very pertinent point. And now I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, yes, uh, could you please do us a big favor? Say who you are, who you work for, and then keep your question reasonably short so we get, and tell us who you would like to answer so we get the maxim here too, the maximum bang for the buck. Um, Uh, thanks very much to the to the panel for being here. Uh, my name is Philip Cornell. I'm a, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council as well, but um, formerly associated uh, uh, with uh, with Ramco. Um, my question is. Um, We've talked about how this was a strategic acquisition uh, because of the ability, obviously, um, to create demand um, for, for, for Aramco as well. But it seems like there's also a, a much bigger strategy, which comes down to, you know, what was the impetus for this original um, merger in the first place? So it seems like, you know, um, a lot of the, you know, and, and I don't know the details, and that's why I'd like to know from you as well. But it seems like the impetus came much from, from higher up, from uh, uh, the palace, from the PIF, um, in order to first, you know, cr pump in liquidity. Um, then the question about, you know, uh, how to pay for it, uh, first from value created from Aramco, and second by the ability of Aramco to leverage, um, uh, to, to go on to international capital markets. Um, with now also the change in leadership, um, uh, of the chairman. We talked about Khalid Al-Fali being uh, instrumental during this merger, but of course now uh, Mr. Al-Rumayan, who came from the PIF, has, has taken his place as chairman. Um, does all of this, what does this imply in terms of the, the long-term role of Aramco um, uh, as either sort of a, a vehicle to, to, to deliver some of that liquidity to the PIF versus um, the long-term strategy. I mean, we talked about uh, upstream gas, uh, uh, which was obviously sort of a hallmark of, of Mr. Alfale's strategy. Is that really, I mean, do we see, oh, and we also talked about the crude to chemical uh, deal. Do, is, yeah, is there a diversion, right? So do, are we starting to see a diversion of, of, of uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. The answer could be very long. So, <laughs> but um, no, I, I totally agree with with uh, Philip because obviously uh, the uh, a lot of the impetus from that came from from the higher ups. I mean, uh, definitely PIF wanted the money. <laughs> And uh, since the uh, since the IP, uh, IPO was taking so long, one quicker way of doing it was to sell one of their main assets, which then could be shown as being creating synergies for the company. But the fact is, yes, they they were this this way they could perhaps insure 69 or 70 billion dollars so definitely that 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 was a very important point. Now it happened that. A lot of the assets of SABIC are really good for Saudi Ramco, so that's why they could actually argue that it's working. But there will be also, as I mentioned earlier in the in the talk, there was a, there is a lot of drawback to this, and so we'll see how it's going to go. So. Oh. Oh, um, I'll just say I think I think that that ignoring the role of the sovereign in this transaction would be, uh, would I think you, you cannot ignore the role of the sovereign in this, particularly now that, um, you know, Yasser Rumayan is, is also the chair of Saudi Ramco. And I do think that it is, um, it is something to pay attention to, this idea that now, you know, Aramco has a role beyond just being a, 
uh, you know, an, an oil and gas company, but it, it, uh, now it's a producer of liquidity for the PIF, as, as you stated. I think that that is something that should uh, be of concern to maybe, you know, potential investors in, in the company and could, uh, I'm going to be absolutely honest here, in my opinion, could threaten Aramco's profitability. Now, it's an extraordinarily profitable company that spends $40 billion in CapEx per year. So it's got plenty of free cash. It's got plenty of money to spend on CapEx, but at the same time, it is a, uh, if, if this was to continue in the future, um, it's definitely something that, that should be, uh, you know, we should be aware of and, and could become uh, uh, threatening to Aramco's profitability. Okay, that's, that's, um, that's interesting. Yes, so we have somebody who actually is from Saudi Aramco, right? Three of us. Three of us, yes, but you're asking a question. Could you... Thank you very much, uh, distinguished panelists. Thank you also for your interest uh, about two major giants that are playing a role in achieving uh, the kingdom's ambitious economy and the development goals. My name is Walid al-Somali. I work in the upstream business support of Saudi Aramco, uh, which is the other side of downstream. But I have a couple of comments and a question. First, uh, just comment to uh, Mr. John Fra Jean Frasouat, who give the impression that Saudi Aramco actually uh, was recently established as far as two years is concerned. Uh, and we don't have, and this is the first, first time we do an audit financial statement. I, I don't think, I, I, I beg to disagree totally. Uh, Saudi Aramco is uh, known for its corporate governance, reliability, and incidents like the uh, malicious attack on our facilities in September proved how reliable this company is and the success of the IPO demonstrate as well uh, this fact. So uh, this statement, I don't know to be honest. Uh, um, the other question is the methodology of developing the case. Um, have you, any one of you met members of our senior management yeah. in developing this business case? We managed to get insights from our uh, either Sabic or Aramco about this integration and uh, other than just uh, looking at uh, uh, sources in the uh, internet or literature review? Um, your, your point is well taken on the audits, by the way. I, 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 you're absolutely right and I did not, I, did, I should have explained this better. And uh, the, the, the answer I gave is because, in fact, there was a lot of banks asking about the audits and so on. And absolutely, that uh, the company is superbly managed. And I think I mentioned that in the in the in the paper. And both companies, but especially Saudi Ramco. And um, in terms of, uh, have I talked to uh, to the senior management? I have talked to the senior management at times, some time ago, but not exactly about this issue. So my, uh, when when I give uh, suggestions I made on the, how this could happen in the future, I was answering the question of what happens when uh, the companies are merged and what happens normally when companies are merged. Then you have always an analysis by the senior management of, of the companies to see where there are similarities and what can be saved and where the synergies can take place. This is really my, the, how I approached it. Now, I have done a fair amount of work over the years on acquisition of chemical companies. So, I, felt, I feel pretty strongly, actually, that, uh, that what I suggested this, uh, this afternoon is probably something that will be looked at. I'm not saying it will happen, by the way. And, uh, and to be quite fair, um, I'm really not sure that if I'd asked that kind of questions to senior management, I would have gotten any answers. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just one final uh, point. This is a very critical time. And I have this question also to the Athletic Council. Uh, have you considered extending uh, an invitation to any member of our, um, uh, at both sides of the equation, Sabek and Aramco, to become part of this panel and give perspectives to avoid any uh, unnecessary ambiguities surrounding the discussion? 
I am not with the Atlantic Council. I'm oh, an sorry. imposter who is just who is just uh, managing no a panel. Um, but it is my understanding that um, uh, to one of the entities, I'm not going to say which one, an invitation was extended. I don't know whether to the other one an invitation was extended, but you know, people are busy, so one never knows. Okay. The subject is of a critical time, and uh, uh, several things can look at and understood from a different perspective. That's why. Thank no, you no, very that's, much. That's a very good point. I just wanted to ask uh, you, Jen, and Esther, so why don't you, because now you're, we have the opportunity to have three of you here, why don't you also share your point of view? Now that we don't have anyone from the panel, it would be... Uh, I'd be delighted, but our background's different. I come from the upstream. My colleague here is the senior researcher. So, so you I, mind if I'm you not in a position okay. to comment, but from a general perspective, the subject okay. uh, requires developing this case could have better looked at, uh, better preparation. Um. I, I, look, I, I would I would agree with you, but I know that invitation I know that invitations to one entity was extended. I think probably also to the other entity, but um, but you know if the extension invitation is extended and nobody is here, then we just go. But we had you here and we had the benefit of your comments, and we thank you for that. We have time for one more question, but it needs to be a quick question, and then I'm going to go into the summation. I've now scared everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one aspect that I think we haven't talked about that much is um, uh, from the SABIC perspective. And uh, there was a, an interesting report that came out uh, around the time that uh, I think the, the merger was announced, uh, or, or possibly uh, before from HSBC, uh, that actually covered uh, uh, they cover SABIC, and uh, the report essentially said that um, they viewed it as a very a positive perspective from the SABIC perspective because they're covering SABIC, and they felt that um, SABIC management might benefit from the uh, from Aramco's man management. And so that's a, an aspect that we haven't necessarily talked about. We talked about how it will benefit Aramco, but it will also perhaps benefit uh, uh, SABIC in, in some ways. No, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Just, just a, 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 a quick explanation. One of the reasons I've been so interested in this is because I've, over the years, I've visited Saudi Aramco many times. And I also made a big point of visiting Sadara at length uh, for a long time. And they were very, very gracious and, and showed me everything that I, I was interested in. So I'm, I'm a great admirer of Saudi Aramco and, and so on. So the only, reason I see that there will be or there could be some changes within SABIC is because common sense in investment banking tells you or in management tells you that sometimes you cannot manage three or four different similar lines of production because that doesn't make any sense in terms of money. Ultimately, though, it, it will work out just fine. Um. And I could, I, I will just come back, I can wholeheartedly agree with that because when you, having done a lot of mergers, when you merge two entities, you try to create those synergies. And if you are a GE, you have a 100 day plan and it's pretty brutal. Um, if you're an, if you're state-owned companies like uh, Sabic and Aramco, you're going to do what needs to be done, but you're probably going to do it with a little bit more consideration to the people. Um, I just wanted to add uh, one point uh, of concern among the investors. When uh, investors' perspective, when they're looking into uh, Aramco IPO, and that's uh, the historical role of Aramco in, o in the OPEC, and how the production in Aramco is going to be decided, because then you know it's just going to uh, contradict with uh, the profit of shareholders, or could at some point. So this has been an issue that has been raised always uh, repeatedly among the investors: is that okay? Then is Saudi Aramco, is Saudi Arabia going to? exit OPEC or they're going to stay in the OPEC and who is going to decide about Saudi, uh, Saudi uh, Arabia, uh, Saudi's oil production? Is it going to be the company or the minister now that uh, Philip was talking about that, like how this uh, division yeah, and that is Yeah, and that is actually a very valid point. But I, yes, yeah, um, very quickly. Oh, uh, I'll quickly answer. So, oh. Yeah, just one more comment. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. But the ministry yeah, it's, it's always the ministry of energy. But it's always the ministry of energy. But, but yeah, but, but you see, in a, in, if you're an IOC, if you're a Shell or a BP, you, you are not going to be told by your country how much you can or cannot produce. But when you're a national oil company, it looks different. And that's not just Aramco, that's for all the national oil companies. But, but also, I, th I think, Phil, and, and you're absolutely right in, in, in that sense. But, and, and one of the reasons of the downstream uh, uh, policies of Khaled al Fali and, and, and a lot of his senior staff, was to create a base load for the crew of Saudi Aramco, the 10 million barrels you, you mm -hmm. produce, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, instead of being uh, exported, exported as crude, then can be pushed downstream. And I think that there's more value added to that. The molecules yeah. have value added. And I think Philip pointed out very well, that's really the policy. And I think in the long run, that is an excellent thing. So. They, they won't depend on the ministry. And Ellen would like to yeah, say have, something, uh, and then I'm going to wrap up. One, one quick, quick issue with that, because that, that I, I think, I think that is a really um, important issue. Maybe not necessarily just the role of OPEC, but if you th if you think about it, and, and I argued this, that um, there's a perception that um, the Saudi government may direct. Um, OPEC pol or may, may direct Ministry of Energy policy in such a way as to try to make more money off of Aramco shares. So the idea is obviously that 1% it was the beginning and that there will be more shares sold later to make more money. And um, if you're going to pr be prepared to sell more shares, you want to sell them at the highest number you possibly can. And in order to do that, you need to show revenue. Well, um, the fastest way or the best way to show revenue is not necessarily to try to cut your barrels of oil to try to raise the oil price, particularly in this market that we have now, but is actually to, sit, to produce more barrels of oil. And so the question really should be, is that going to affect, um, is, is the desire to make more money from selling more Aramco shares, is that going to affect Saudi Arabia's policy within OPEC? Okay. Uh, and that that's a question that I think we need to, I think to be that's, aware of. I think that's a, good, that's a good point. And I think we need to wrap up one sentence, then we need to wrap up. Well, it's all about value added. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think if they, if they can produce, if the Saudi Arabia can produce 10 million barrels a day in the long run and go downstream for the whole 10 million, the value of these of this, uh, this carbon molecules will be increased by two or three or four times. So the income of Saudi Aramco will be even bigger. Uh, and I think that was the purpose. Now, whether or not we see that, we don't know. But uh, I think that's, that's the whole idea of I the merger. I think that's a great um, last comment because it is about strategic value creation. I think we can put this, this panel on the thing of this, if this particular mega merger as strategic value creation. And as you very nicely pointed out, at a time when the PIF needed money um, and I, Aramco needed to diversify, that, that, that worked very well. That worked. That worked very well t t together. Um, and looking at looking into the future, petrochemicals is very much where the demand is. Downstream is where the demand is. Petrochemical is where the demand is. Although I would like to add one caveat: if you look at the IEA forecasts, we're still growing by more than a million barrels per year for quite some time to come. So, so, um, so we should not we should not forget about that either. Um, um, the, the merger has created, um, you know, has created the, the, the largest petrochemical company in, in the world. Um, it, it, it helps the diversification. It creates synergies. Um, when you look at where, when you look at where the, when you look at where the, where, where the investments are, a lot of them are close to the market. And that's, as Ellen pointed out very well, that has been a, a strategic, um, a strategic um, um, imperative of Aramco for some time to come. When you look at Motiva, um, the, the the biggest the biggest refinery in the U.S., um, and when then when you look at the joint ventures and the and uh, and, and 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 all the, the the ventures in in China, in Japan, in the Philippines, in Korea. Um, um, I think w one of the things that we also talked about, which is very important, 
um, when we look at the decision, um, the role of gas should not be neglected because the transfer, we are, we are now talking about related party transaction when, we, when, when Aramco buys gas from, uh, uh, when Sabic buys gas from Aramco, it's no longer, it doesn't have to buy it at, at market prices, which it would have to do under, under, uh, under, transparent, uh, under transparent rules. Um, we have um, we have seen that the um, the initial bond offering, particularly of um, of Aramco, has really done a great deal of even if the transparency was there of showing that the transparency was there um, to the to the world markets and the IBO, the initial bond offering, was a huge success. It was ten times oversubscribed. Um, one, man, one, one thing again that Ellen said was that we cannot ignore, and you pointed that out, we cannot ignore the role of the sovereign, especially as the sovereign owns the mineral in, in the ground. Um, um, and um, we should look. We should look at when we look at this strategic acquisition. I thought that was a very, very good point that Sarah made. When we look at the uh, acquisition, it creates security of demand also for um, for for the for for the oil for 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 Aramco. Um, so in in that in in that. Um, in, in, to that point, um, I think it's been a great panel. We've all benefited. You are real experts. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for your interventions. That was very important and very welcome. And thank everybody. You've been a great panel. And um, I'm Swiss, so it's very important. We're finishing on time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>